Good afternoon. Hi. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Afton Thomas. I'm our Associate Director for Programs here at the Center for the Study of Silent Culture. Thank you all for coming to our first South Talk of the semester. I would like to introduce you to today's speakers. As you may know, our theme this academic year is Creativity in the South. I couldn't think of a better start to the semester than for our guests to introduce and maybe in some cases um, reintroduce or remind you of artist Miss Ellie Hall. I love a good story and this one has all the elements. A character that is a person with flair, style, an innovator, friendship, community, and co-conspirators. <laughs> Here with us today are two co-conspirators in making sure L.B. Hull's legacy lives on. We have Yafit Smith is a screenwriter, lawyer, and documentary filmmaker based in Austin, Texas. He is dedicated to enriching life through story with an emphasis on stories that reflect black people's full humanity. Yafit's connection to Miss L.B. Hull is through a shared community. His mother is from Casiasco, Mississippi. He will tell you more about how he came to know Ms. Ho in a bit. Annalise Splinning is an independent curator and arts administrator based in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. She holds a bachelor's degree from Northwestern University and a master's degree from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Please help me give a warm welcome to our speaker, Jacqueline and Annalise. Thank you so much, Afton. I think we don't even have to speak. Afton uh, covered everything. That was great. That was a wonderful introduction. And I want to thank all of you for attending. Thanks to everybody who watches this online later. And you know, we are extremely honored um, to be part of this culturally rich South Talk, uh, um, South Talk series on creativity. And you know, Annalise, though she lives in Wisconsin, I live in Texas, but she's from South Haven. I'm from Starkville, uh, where there's another university. And uh, this is my first time in Oxford, first time in a while for you. But you know, as the saying goes, we got here as soon as we could. And you know, we really are um, happy to be able to share a little bit about LV's creative legacy. And along the way, we're going to talk about the role of storytelling, as well as the story of these preservation efforts so far. And so you might wonder why, are we, you know, why we're talking about storytelling. And it's because when seeking to understand LV's artistry and her life, uh, the stories we tell ourselves crop up immediately. Stories about art, creativity, creativity in the South, race, women, uh, as well as uh, questions about whether we're getting the full story of life and art in America and in the South. And sometimes these stories contain preconceived notions or uh, ready-made narratives. And that doesn't mean that those notions or narratives are necessarily wrong, but we want to do our best to avoid these knee-jerk reactions and look clearly at LV's art and at her life so that we can convey her unique, generous, creative spirit in an accurate and compelling way. Right. And when I say we, I really do mean uh, we. So Annalise and I are speaking today, but we have Alan Massey here, we have Jason and Alicia Bolden, uh, people who have been committed to LV for a long time, uh, and actually for over two decades, to ensure that her legacy survives to inspire um, new generations. And so we'll move. So here's today's journey quickly. We're going to introduce LV. Um, I'll talk about the documentary, which is called Love is a Sensation. And as I said, we'll talk about storytelling throughout, but we'll do a little more of a deep dive on storytelling in the documentary section. And then we'll introduce you to the pioneering, super exciting LV Hull Legacy Center, uh, which is forthcoming in Kosciuszko. And then we'll have some time uh, for Q&A, right? So, but to get started with the introduction uh, of LV, you know, every visit with her at least to me, to a lot of people who came to visit her, was like tumbling down the rabbit hole, right? Nothing could really prepare you. So, uh, but in that spirit, we're going to start 
uh, and just let you experience her a little bit through the trailer for Love is a Sensation. And again, that's my one hour home video affectionate portrait of LV. And uh, I'm not a trained documentarian, so I'm self-taught just like she was self-taught. Um, but let me just cue this up quickly. And it's about two and a half minutes and Here we go. Sometimes you can be down and out. Somebody will come along and you forget about what hurt you. The unusual artist. LV? Hey. Who is that? This is the art. So glad to see you. That water my wig. Let me show you how I look with it on. I know I ain't pretty, but I can look the gentleman sometimes. San Diego, California. Denver, Colorado. Louisville, Kentucky. New Orleans, Chicago. Detroit. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Switzerland. That's the most German. As his voice was going away, he was trying to tell us to take care of his bicycle. That's what he was trying to say. Mm. If so, building, keep on leaning. I got to move to a better home. It's a whole university of the peoples of Patala County. Got on my nerve. Love is a sensation. Start by a conversation. Spread by the population and hush like an operation. Who does love you? But Milton love me. Yeah. Oh, that means something else, I'm telling you. Are you going to find him up? Dear Mr. King, I love Miss L.V. I think you would enjoy visiting with her. And I might tell him, do not try to understand me, Mr. B.B. King. Just love me. So that, that, oh, <laughs> so that young man in the trailer happens to be me. Uh, but, um, and so I'll hand it over to Annalise, who is going to provide, uh, provide uh, like more robust introduction uh, to LV. All right. Hello. Um, well, thank you so much for being here. Just to echo Yafet and say thank you to Afton and Katie and the whole rest of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture for having us. I mean, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here and always to talk about LV. Mm. Um, so I have the great pleasure of telling you more about LV and her work and her practice. Um, LV purchased her home in 1974 with wages from domestic work when she was in her early 30s. She was an artist her entire life, but it wasn't until she had access to her own space and purchased her own home and had the autonomy that that home provided that her practice really took off in remarkable ways. So LV started as a collector. She filled her home with precious items, some that she kept for curated displays and others that she sold to other collectors. She eventually began painting using primarily found objects as her canvas and acrylic paint from Walmart. She developed a signature style, bright concentrated dots that you can see on her hat right there. Uh, clever sayings. She called this quote, doing the LV. She also called the discreet pieces that she made her pretty things. And then she even adorned herself in her work, painting many hats and shoes and other items of clothing. I wanna take us through a couple of um, LV's different hallmark 
types of work. Um, this first type is her painted signs. Um, some of these were sayings that she would come across out in the world. Um, others are sayings that she would come up with herself. Many are reflective of her values and beliefs and also her pretty incredible sense of humor. This one says, I started with nothing and still have most of it. Take time to appreciate, do not try to understand me, just love me, and mind your business. <laughs> this one says, Jesus is on the main line, tell him what you want. Uh, one of LV's main signatures was multicolored dots. She would apply her dot treatment to just about any item that she came across, and people would also bring her things, and she would say, you want me to do the LV? And they would, of course, say yes. So here is a painted saw of hers. Here are a couple of other found objects that she would use, so a box, a syrup container, and then I believe that is a sea urchin souvenir, all transformed. Hubcaps were a favorite and also very popular with visitors who would come and uh, buy pieces of art from her. Um, she also had another type of work that she called her plackets. So it's these assemblage pieces um, that she would also use found or collected items on. So on this one, you can see there's a bunch of costume jewelry, um, different like little decorative things, uh, Cigarette lighters, um, buttons were a big one. And here is another placket. And then, as I mentioned earlier, she also painted hats and shoes and other pieces of clothing. And here she is wearing a couple of those pieces. You can see her shoes are dotted too, plus her hat. Her artwork eventually began to radiate outwards into the front yard, eventually becoming a dense and evolving and prismatic installation. Uh, not everyone in town appreciated LV, uh, LV's artwork, but she was beloved by many, and her home was a beacon of creativity and personal pride in her historically African-American neighborhood. She was an active part of her community and created a space not only for private meditation, but also to welcome friends and neighbors, to exchange place of, plates of food, and I would imagine some gossip. LV's work coalesces to form a genre of art making known as artist-built environments. So, what is an artist-built environment? Uh, an artist-built environment is a personal space, like a home, garden, or studio, fully transformed into continually evolving, site-specific, and life-encompassing works of art. So they are combinations of art architecture and or landscape architecture, including religious grottos, spiritual, devotional, and mystical sites, gardens, ephemeral yard shows, architectural inventions, homes fully transformed, artist museums, and many other artist created spaces. So I want to share a couple of art environments with you just so you can understand the incredible range of this genre. It's really hard to put your arms around but generally they do fall somewhere within that definition that I just shared. Mm -hmm. So this is Leonard Knight's Salvation Mountain. It is in Nyland, California, and it was an expression of Knight's uh, faith made from adobe, painted adobe, um, that he packed into the side of an existing ridge in the Sonoran Desert of Imperial County, California. It's about two and a half hours east of San Diego. Um, that's Leonard perched at the very top of the mountain over here on the right. Um, Leonard passed away in 2014, but there is a board of directors that continues to maintain the mountain. Um, there's a caretaker that lives on site, and I totally recommend that you go. This is Kia Tawana. Um, Kia built this ark from scavenged material that she took from um, structures in Newark that she was charged with dismantling. And then she created this ark in a church parking lot. And unfortunately, the city of Newark forced her to dismantle this in 1989. This is Louis Lee, who landed in Phoenix, Arizona after immigrating from China in the 1920s. Um, he filled his entire yard um, in Phoenix with uh, found object sculptures. And Mr. Lee has passed away, but the home does remain um, in, with the family, and it is not open to the public, but uh, 
Um, it's pretty extraordinary. Mm. This is Charlie Stagg's studio in Vidor, Texas. Um, Charlie's studio compound was built on the site of his family's former hog farm in Texas, and he used bottles and other cast off materials to create several bottle structures, um, all modeled after um, Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes. And then finally, this is Loy Bolin, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, Loy is the uh, self-proclaimed original rhinestone cowboy. Um, he built his beautiful holy jewel home in Macomb, Mississippi. Um, Loy uh, fully took on this persona, including embellishing his own nudie suits. <laughs> you can see on the left here, and he would head downtown to Macomb where he would play the harmonica and clog and sing. Um, Loy was extremely committed to this, including having rhinestones embedded in his dentures. And so the entire home has been saved and it was actually moved to the John Michael Kohler Art Center um, where it still exists today. And they also have the dentures, in case you're wondering. Um, so uh, as you can see from this very small collection, there are hundreds and hundreds of these kinds of sites all over the world. Um, that there is incredibly, there's an incredibly wide range of practices that fall under this umbrella term of artist built environments. And then given the range of non-traditional and non-archival materials, and the fact that many of these artists belong to marginalized communities, so they were people of color, um, they were impoverished, they lived in rural areas, um, and they were um, or were not at the time recognized as being a part of the mainstream art world, Many of these environments did not receive the institutional support necessary to preserve them after the artist left the site or passed away. Mm -hmm. And many of these efforts, including you know, Salvation Mountain that I showed you first, is continued to be run by a volunteer board of directors who are just extremely committed to Leonard's legacy and continuing to see the mountain stand as long as that is possible. So back to LV's, um, I wanted to go through a couple of the type, the, the facets of her art environment that make us consider it to be an art environment. So the first one is site specificity. So LV's work was very much a product of her environment. Owning her own home allowed her to do exactly as she pleased with her property. She also lived in an African American neighborhood surrounded by friends and family, and we can imagine that it was this sense of community that helped to give her the confidence to pursue this extremely public expression of creativity. Abundance and accumulation. So while LV did make discreet artworks that she sold to patrons, in terms of uh, the installations both inside and outside of her home, all of these separate pieces come together to form one cohesive piece of art that is much more than the sum of its parts. And so sometimes when I think about art environments, I think of um, whatever the pet is that will grow to the size of its container. Maybe this is a myth, but like a turtle, <laughs> um, that the turtle will grow until it's reached the limits in an art environment. Generally, they will grow until they have reached the limits of their containers. And usually, they're spilling out into the neighbor's yard, too. And here is another view of LV surrounded by her work. This is inside. This is actually her bedroom. She's sitting on her bed in that photo. And then here is her fridge with some incredible magnets that maybe I recognize some of these from my childhood. I'm assuming that y'all recognize some of these too. So resourcefulness and use of found objects. Uh, much of the time, but not always, artists creating environments use found materials. So these can be lots of mass produced objects, toys, um, dishware, cast off construction materials, um, things that are gifted to them. So LV purchased a lot of her materials from the local Walmart, but she also sourced materials through friends and community members. Um, people that were exposed to her work would write to her and offer to send her things. We were just going through the archive and saw somebody saw um, a TV program about her work and offered to send her some shoes from Canada. Uh, people would bring her Mardi Gras beads, just whatever they had on hand. Um, and so you can see in this photo, there are painted egg cartons, there's a bike tire, there's another syrup container, and there's a lot more that I'm sure you could point out here. And then continuous evolution. The work is never, ever, ever done. It's always changing, it's never complete. 
and this was definitely true of Elvie's yard. So here is a, a relatively early photo of when she started to move her work out into the front yard. This is by George Sanders and it's from 1988. So you can see one of the early hallmarks of her work was placing these shoes on like sort of garden stakes throughout the yard. So she has this uh, shoe flower garden that she's forming and this is before she started to paint anything. And then here is 1997, so not even uh, 10 years later. Here she has definitely accumulated more artwork. And then this is 2003, um, and you can see that she is just surrounded by her. She's completely absorbed and subsumed by this installation. And so in terms of this evolution, one of the things that we've heard from people, especially folks that grew up in Kosciuszko, is that they would ask their parents, please, can we drive by Miss LV's house because I want to see what's changed um, since the last time that we drove by. She was always out there doing something in the yard. And so we have one of these children here with us today. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it back to yes. Yafet. Thank you, Anna yeah. Inner child, my inner child. Is here. <laughs> um, and so the, and looking at these art environments, like, why would you paint your walls beige or whatever? You, know, you could really... Could really go for something in life. But um, so, yeah, I first encountered LV when I was anywhere from four to six years old, and uh, she lived five houses away um, from my grandmother. And um, so, my cousins and I would always pass her house on the way to the corner store to get, you know, chocolate footballs and sour pickles and comic books and stuff like that. And I was um, scared of her at first. And, uh, you know, so here, me and my cousins. And um, her yard wasn't this developed, but you know, people said she practiced voodoo. And uh, so we definitely scurry past. But one day, I'll go back a sec, she gave us some um, freeze pops. I was like, oh, this lady's okay. You know, this lady's not too bad. And uh, so, but I pursued a pretty traditional educational and career path. Uh, but in college, I um, had creative pursuits. I acted, I wrote some. And then when I was a CPA, I wrote my first screenplay, and then I went to law school. But then after law school, I really wanted to get back to sort of more uh, creative pursuits. And I had been you know, very interested in screenwriting and storytelling and become very interested in telling stories about black people from the inside out in ways that reflect our full humanity. So blemish and beauty mark, right? Uh, so I brainstormed some after law school, and I really wanted to revisit LV as an adult. And my wife, Kelly, had bought me a video camera. So finally, around 2001 is when I decided to start recording her. And you know, because of my storytelling interest, I really wanted to see uh, how I could create an opportunity for her to star in a story of her own. Um, so uh, here's what I mean by story, right? An account, whether true or fictitious, designed to interest, amuse, or instruct the audience. And I think that's okay, but you know, stories can do more. For instance, they can also inspire us. You know, and I feel like uh, any story about LV in particular is probably going to be inspirational. She was a creative inspiration to me, and I think in particular her example of letting your light shine uh, was especially inspirational to folks that came in contact with her. And hopefully you'll be similarly inspired or re-inspired if you already know about her. So uh, here are some of the basic elements of a story. You know, it's super simplified, but um, it's a peek behind the curtain. You know, we have character, so that's just the protagonist. Who is the story about? From whose point of view is the story told? Setting, where are we? Are we in the South? We're talking about creativity in the South. So what are the rules of this world? How might it impact a character's quest? There's generally a meaningful problem of some sort uh, that gets resolved in some way. Not necessarily solved, but resolved. Often there's some kind of twist that reflects some kind of fundamental truth about life, which brings me to core theme. That represents the meaning of a story at the fundamental level, often reflects some essential meaning in life. Uh, and because it's fundamental, there's a few themes that storytellers re re uh, return to. So you see like Great Love Defies All, Even Death, a few different movies that that kind of, or stories that, that can apply to. Selfless Acts Redeem the Soul. Uh, Barbie, it might be about having the courage uh, to realize your full human potential. Uh, so 
these are themes that re recur. And as I, uh, so the, sorry, the box is there, I'll fill in with insights about LV as I go along. And uh, so I, as I started to film her and plan some, uh, I was looking for something that could, um, something to build a story around. And I learned she had this special artwork for B.B. King, right, that she wanted to give uh, to him. And she would sell anything that was in that house uh, except for that B.B. King placket. That was his, and she wanted to give it to him. Uh, excuse me, to give it to him. And so I'm, I want to show you a clip from the documentary. And it's the, the first scene in the movie. It's only 60 seconds. But it offers a cornucopia, uh, I think, of insights about storytelling that uh, guide us as we share her legacy. So let me uh, do this right quick. And this is still the work in progress cut. So you'll see a little time code up in the upper left corner. So 60 seconds, now we can get down to some nitty gritty on the storytelling. So, um, you know, this was the first frame. You know immediately, we were talking about character, it's about LV. She's a protagonist, it's her story. You learn a little bit about her character. She's a very frank person. Your name ain't B.B. King, so you can't have the placket. Uh, and she's also a person, a person with a dream. And it um, might be a little disorienting the way that it starts, just uh, cold that way, but part of that is uh, because it's disorienting, we have to rely on her to orient us, and I, hopefully that kind of binds us to her. She's our guide, and uh, we see through her eyes uh, and kind of connect with her. And then uh, that should be a pretty unremarkable start in a lot of ways, but um, you know, how often do you see a senior black woman as the star of her own story, right? A black woman over 60. And you might think about Medea might pop to mind, or uh, Big Mama, and, uh, which is actually you know, men dressed as women. But Tyler Perry in particular, that comes from a lot of respect and affection for women in his community, but often not starring in the story. And then maybe the help, if you're thinking about Mississippi and Abilene. Uh, but Abilene was about 53 uh, in the film and a uh, powerful performance. And you know, Viola has expressed some regrets about the fact that the black char characters, uh, the story wasn't told through their point of view, but she has you know, loved the experience with the actors uh, on the film and the director. So there's a couple of, uh, a few common roles then. Uh, a supporting character and kind of a white savior narrative that uh, we might see. Um, a lens to examine race or a certain social issue, particularly in documentaries. You will see uh, that a lot with uh, black characters. And um, sometimes it can be done in a uh, sort of, uh, with a lot of humanity. This is um, I'm Carolyn Parker, which is by Jonathan Demme and looks at Hurricane Katrina. But particularly in the documentary world, if black lives are always used to examine an issue or problem, we can come to associate blackness with problems. And you know that can become inadvertently dehumanizing. We need those films, but we also need, I think, a broader portfolio of stories. Um, 
and then the magical Negro. So that's the other kind of common trope, uh, which is it has its own Wikipedia entry, and it's often a, a black person with some sort of supernatural powers or insight that helps a white character in their self-actualization. Uh, there's a forthcoming movie, The American Society of Magical Negroes, which I don't know much about. Um, but uh, this is a, a great quote from Jesse Williams, though, uh, who was on uh, Grey's Anatomy. And uh, my wife has this in her email signature. And uh, the idea that I was saying before, there are these preconceived notions or tropes that are out there. They're not necessarily wrong. But what Jesse's saying here is just because we're magic, it doesn't mean we aren't real. So the idea here is to try to mine the majesty of, their, of that realness. And you know, we ask, why are there this lack of stories about senior African American women? And it's what I've called the triple curse of cinematic invisibility, race, age, and sex. That's based on uh, Robert Purvis and the idea of a double curse uh, back in 1869. He said he wanted his daughter to have the right to vote before him so she'd have a voice to overcome the double curse of sex and color you know, at that time. And, but there are, uh, so sorry, I wrote a little bit about this in a uh, blog post. And I think it's really just a reflection of society's values. And I think the way to transcend it is just to recognize that uh, grown black women's stories are always uh, important. Uh, there's a couple of recent examples that are great, Going to Mars, about Nikki Giovanni, Origin, uh, Isabel Wilkerson, uh, that character is a little younger, but Ava DuVernay, DuVernay and Angelou Ellis do a great job, and I think it's a, a sign of things to come. And I think, uh, you know, like I said, Viola expressed some regrets about uh, her role in the help, and um, I think the uh, you know, like Viola, LV also did domestic work. And, um, but now I think we're in a situation with this project where it's almost like somebody who would normally be a supporting character is now getting a star in their own story uh, through this documentary, through the Legacy Center. So that's the character. The setting is obviously her home and art environment that uh, Annalise was talking about. And the way I was thinking about LV is that she married um, art making and the southern art of visiting to create this space to commune you know, with her creator, with herself, with friends, with strangers. And this actually, this concept uh, actually came from the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. So thank you all for that. And the, um, the uh, new encyclopedia of Southern Culture. I was actually looking for something else and saw the entry that was in there about um, visiting. And uh, for LV, it was so total that one of her visitors actually remarked, you don't know where the art stops and LV begins, right? But then uh, another feature of the setting I wanted to point out is this idea of we. So you see in this uh, scene uh, from the start of the movie, uh, she says, we tried to get B.B. King. We wrote, white people wrote, them artists wrote, we. Right? So I think the idea is that by looking at her life from the inside out, looking at her dreams, you get a more nuanced view of the role that race plays in our lives. Right? So there's a cooperative element here. We, we. Now, white people, right? she's aware of race. We know there's race in the world. Them artists, there's other types of people that are helping her, and we. Uh, so I think that's a, uh, you know, a beautiful point more nuanced, kind of transcends this invisibility, trauma porn, what have you. And uh, you know, it's about her life. So race will show up, joy will show up uh, in, a, in a fuller story. And then the problem is clear. She wants to meet B.B. King, because that man is something else. And that's an example of her artistry in action. Um, and, but normally, in stories, a lot of them are based on this template called The Hero's Journey, which you may have heard of. Joseph Campbell kind of identified it in myths around the world. George Lucas used it for Star Wars. It kind of goes counterclockwise here. Some of the keys, though, is it's very male-centric. You see, like, number nine, reward, seizing the sword, return with the elixir. It's very much travel, battle, acquire. But we think about what LV wanted. 
She wants him to have that placket, wants him to cherish that placket, right? For her, it's a gift narrative. She wants to take a, a, a journey to give something away. So why is this significant? Well, let's think about why stories are so important. They fulfill this profound human need to grasp the patterns of living, not merely as an intellectual exercise, but with a, within a very personal, emotional experience, right? Um, so imagine the patterns of living that we miss by limiting whose stories get told and how those stories are told, right? And uh, so that's kind of the, the problem and the special nature of uh, a problem that we get by exploring LV's story. And I'm gonna jump down to core theme. And it's clear, it was all about love for her. Love, love, love. You saw what is love? Love is a sensation. Do not try to understand me, just love me. And then when I realized that you can't even spell love without LV, I was like, oh, you know, there's a theme there. It's art as an act of love. And uh, in the film, I try to have, you see a lot of these arrows go from left to right. Because in a film, you want some narrative drive. So it was really about art as a path to love, to see if she could get to B.B. King, some kind of love of self, that kind of thing. But art as an act of love, if you think about that, how often do we hear art spoken that way, about that way? Now, some of you might. Like Jason, you're an artist. So. Um, but a lot of times, it's about, is the art good? Is it bad? Is it art at all? How famous is the artist? How much did the art sell for? I think exploring LB's life gives, a, it gives us a chance to expand the ways we can engage with art to enrich our lives. And this isn't the only theme in her life, but we're keeping it front and center and, uh, and looking at how sharing her artistry through the documentary, the Legacy Center, a forthcoming ex exhibition at the Mississippi Museum of Art, how can that spread or facilitate love, again, of self, of a higher power, of one another. And then the resolution, so what happened? No spoilers. December 2024, <laughs> you should be able to find out. Uh, if you've been fortunate enough to see the film, uh, keep it to yourself. And, um, but uh, as I said, in December, we should be able to uh, open the Legacy Center and uh, in conjunction with an exhibit at the Mississippi Museum of Art. And Annalise will tell you a little more about the backstory of the Legacy Center and how it came about. Okay, so I don't know if you mentioned this, Yafit, when you were talking about creating the film, but um, Yafit had heard that Elvie wasn't doing well. Her health started to decline in the 2000s, the early 2000s. So Yafit was really focused on filming the, his time with her between 2001 and 2004, um, and he got there in time because unfortunately Elvie passes away at the age of 65 in 2008. So after that, in 2010, um, a friends group forms, actually spearheaded in part by Alan Massey, who's sitting here in the front row. So thanks, Alan, for that. Um, and the friends of uh, LV Hall, what their intention is, is to figure out how, and, we'll, and Alan can tell you later better if I'm messing any of this up, but essentially the intention was um, to figure out how to save some of LV's work. I mean, it's most of it is sitting outside. Obviously, it's exposed to the elements. And so how do they rally together? I mean, these were people who were friends with LV, who were neighbors with LV, who brought her food, who took her to doctor's appointments, who brought her supplies from Walmart. So these people have been extremely invested in LV's story and her practice for a long time. So now they wanna see like, what are the next steps for this and how can we continue to share her work within Kosciuszko? So they form this group, and then one of the things that happens after this is that through a Mississippi Arts Commission grant, they're able to engage Fred Fussell, who's a curator and artist and folklorist um, in Columbus, Georgia, to come in and do a site report to figure out what can possibly be done there. And so Fred offers a range of options. Um, obviously, the, the best option is to preserve it in place, to have her home accessible to the public, and to keep the art right exactly where that she made it. But unfortunately, that just was not feasible at the time. And so one of the other options was to package up as much as possible of her collection, of the outdoor environment, of her personal effects, and to store it somewhere safely until next steps do become feasible. Um, and so that's what they do. They package up the artwork and much of her archival material, and they store it in the basement of City Hall. 
And just as a quick aside, um, Fred Fussell was also instrumental in the preservation of another art environment that some of y'all may know about called Passaquan in Columbus, Georgia, that was created by Eddie Owens Martin, AKA St. Ohm, E-O-M, Ohm. Um, you should definitely also add this to your list. So in 2019, um, I am doing research uh, in Spaces Archives, which is an archive that I manage um, on behalf of the Kohler Foundation in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And Spaces stands for Saving and Preserving Arts and Cultural Environments. It is the world's largest repository of documentation of art environments in the world. And so when I started in 2019, something that was a mission of mine was to make sure that we were highlighting and documenting art environments by women and people of color in particular. So I was just browsing around and seeing what we had and I came across LV's work um, documented within our collection. And I was not previously aware of LV, but I saw that her work was being stored still in the city hall basement, or at least that's the information that we had from like 2011. So at that point, I'm like, well, I'm just gonna call Kosciuszko and see what's happening here. And so I called the city hall, they put me straight to the top, I'm on the phone with the mayor, <laughs> and he's like, yes, it's in our basement, let me connect you with Alan Massey. So um, I get to talk to Alan after this, and it is so clear from speaking with Alan that LV was beloved, that her artwork was cherished, that there's so much community um, support for this and that they really want to keep the work in Kosciuszko. And so um, luckily after that, um, I was able to go to my colleagues at the Kohler Foundation on the preservation team. So I am not on the preservation team, but I work with them. And really what Kohler Foundation focuses on, one of their primary areas of giving is the preservation of art environments. So Passaquan that I just showed you earlier, they were the ones that preserved Passaquan in 2017 and many other sites around the United States. So um, I was able to go to my colleagues and say, listen, there's this great artwork in Kosciuszko. I think that y'all are gonna love it. Um, and they really want to keep it there. This is a project that I think you should consider and I bugged them about it a lot and luckily they were like, okay, fine. Um, and so they took a trip to Kosciuszko and um, I was able to share Yafet's film with them, which they watched. Um, they noted that the film was the wind and the sails of the project, so that really made an impact um, on them. You know, obviously also like getting to meet LV um, through that film was important. And so um, they were able to take it on as a preservation project. And at that point, the Friends of LV Hall, that original group dissolved and a new group was formed called the Arts Foundation of Kosciuszko. And the Arts Foundation's mission is to be the permanent steward of this collection. And it's formed from a lot of people who were involved in the Friends group. Um, Yafet is on that board as well. Um, and I work for that board on this project. So in 2022, uh, the Kohler Foundation completes conservation on the collection. So they come down to Mississippi, they grab up all the stuff, they take it back to Sheboygan where they clean, conserve, catalog, photograph about uh, 850 pieces of artwork by LV. Um, and then uh, they bring it back down and they gift it to the Arts Foundation who are the permanent stewards. The Kohler Foundation also supports the purchase of a piece of property on LV Street for the future LV Hall Legacy Center, which we're gonna talk more about. And then that same year, a curatorial committee is formed. So that includes me, Yafet, Allen, um, folklorist and friend of LV, Georgia Ware, Ryan Dennis, who is the former chief curator at the Mississippi Museum of Art and now the senior curator at um, the Contemporary Art Museum Houston, and Lydia Jasper, who is the assistant curator at the Mississippi Museum of Art, and Rachel, Rachel Reichert, who is um, now with the Ruth Foundation for the Arts. And here's the curatorial team, minus Alan and Rachel. We're standing in front of what we have been told is the old, <laughs> oldest, biggest? Uh, I thought it was oldest. Oldest sassafras tree is that in, right now? oldest? Uh, oldest sassafras tree <laughs> okay. in the state of Mississippi. So right. that's where we are. It's in Kosciuszko. Don't miss it. Yeah. 
And uh, last year in 2023, we received a Mississippi Arts Commission building fund for the arts grant for $315,000 to go toward the construction of the Legacy Center. So um, big thanks to MAC and also to the Mississippi State Legislature for that essential funding. And then this year, we will be working with Belinda Stewart Architects to renovate some structures um, on that property that was purchased thanks to the Kohler Foundation to create the Legacy Center with the plan to partially open the site to the public in December and the, the following buildings will be opened hopefully the beginning of next year. And so just to orient you, um, so this is an aerial view um, of a portion of LV's neighborhood. So in the yellow circle, that's where the Legacy Center is gonna be. It's at the intersection of Allen Street and Huntington. And then down a ways in the purple, that's LV's house. So they are pretty much almost right next door to each other. And then this is the site now, the, the street view of the Legacy Center site, standing from the corner, looking sort of back down the street toward LV's. And just to share um, what will be happening at this site. So the site contains four structures now. Um, and the goal is to use these, con uh, these structures to form a creative campus, um, including LV's house. Uh, to provide opportunities for creativity in Kosciuszko. And so there'll be a range of things that happen there, um, including um, arts programming, other types of community programming that looks at the fullness of LV's life, um, a creative residency, um, and uh, permanent um, collection space, rotating exhibitions. And so the way that that's, we're currently thinking of it is this white building, right? The, it's a little skewed because the white building is actually pretty small, but the white building on the corner, the furthest right here, will hopefully be a creative studio, so where we can invite residents in, whether they be visual artists, performing artists, writers, chefs, put it on your radar, mm -hmm. maybe you can come and be our resident. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be a creative studio. Um, Right to the left of that, you can't see it very well, but right there where that tree is, that's actually um, a barn slash workshop. So this property used to be a monuments company. They made tombstones, headstones, other things there. Um, and so that was the marble workshop. And so that will be um, like an open air pavilion. It could be a workshop space, um, uh, performances, screenings, other activities. The yellow two-story house will be staff offices, art storage, a creative residence apartment, programming space, a gift shop. Uh, so come buy merch, um, other great stuff. And then the white house just to the left, the furthest left, that will be where the um, permanent collection of LV's materials are stored. There will be um, a media room to show film. There will be a study room and then a rotating exhibition space. And um, that house is a little bit similar to the footprint of um, LV's house. We don't want to pretend that this is LV's house, but we want to make sure that when people come that they understand how critical this idea of home is to that space and feel that sense of home um, when they enter. And so um, on that, Yafit's going to talk more about the home. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, so um, before I dive into uh, a little more on the home, the, I want to talk a little about the significance of this site. Annalise mentioned that the Friends of LV Hall wanted to keep the, her art in Kosciuszko, right? And um, so there's this great sense, and Annalise also mentioned the sense of place for art environments. And then, but her neighborhood also was extremely significant, and again, her home uh, was extremely significant because it gave her the freedom to exercise her imagination. And she says she started, she bought the home in 75 and she started working with her imagination in 75. She actually bought it late in 74, but started with her imagination uh, shortly, shortly after. So it was important also to me to try to get her home and incorporate it if we could because of that significance and the fact that with again just glue and paint from Walmart and discarded objects she created this wonderland that was a beacon that attracted people from around the world um, so <clears throat> you know this is what her house looks like you know roughly as of 2021 doesn't look too much different um, right now and so it's not the 
you know, the wonderland that we remember, but her DNA is still there. So for example, you can see the nails and spikes there where she uh, hung her collections. The faded spots on the wall are sort of a landscape of her imagination. And this is the wall where, you know, the B.B. King placket hung at one time. And again, she moved stuff around all the time. So it was really important to me to try to save this if we could. So just a quick flashback. So when Kohler visited, this is uh, Liesl Testwitty and Beth Wiesa from the Kohler Foundation. And when they came to visit in April 2021, you know, we were talking to them about sites, uh, what Kohler could potentially do. And um, I had been talking to the person who bought LV's house, and it's actually her neighbor, her next door neighbor. And the, I had asked him if he'd ever be interested in selling. Uh, he wasn't, but I had asked him if we could have her front door. Uh, because if you're visiting, that's the first thing you see, and maybe that's something we could repurpose or even just have it in a gallery space so people can uh, experience. Uh, what that was like. So in April, I had asked him, he was out of town, the owner was out of town, his name is Mr. Johnny Hunt. I had asked him if I could take the door, and he said yes. Uh, so I went uh, next door to get the door, and um, I saw that the house was for sale. I was uh, surprised, and I asked him about it, and you know, unfortunately, he had had uh, some health issues and had uh, been out of town for a long time, and he had lost the house. Uh, to an investor. And so this is kind of a you know, storytelling uh, uh, perspective, a moment of truth, uh, both historically and personally, right? Because uh, from a historical perspective, Annalise already touched on this, a lot of homes of female African-American artists, let alone self-taught artists, uh, get lost to time. So if you're talking about, uh, this is Mary T. Smith, whose home was in uh, Hazelhurst, uh, Mississippi. We're not sure of the status. It may be a family home or personal home now. And she has work in private museum, I mean in museums and private collections. So she's a well-known artist, uh, well-respected artist. But we don't know what's going to happen with her home. This is uh, Nellie Mae Rowe. Um, her home was called the Playhouse, her environment in Vinings, Georgia. And that no longer exists, right? It's been, it's been destroyed. So historically, this is a rare chance to save uh, one of these homes and <clears throat> and you know personally it's a chance to change the story right this was a hallowed space it really memorializes all these memories and inspiration both for me and for the thousands of people who came to visit her and uh, so there's it's kind of what Annalise touched on with all the people who are involved is the spirit of generosity that has been around this project since the beginning and Mr. Hunt uh, he said, he has a deeper voice than I do. I can't really do the voice, but he said, well, Yavit, I prayed on it, talked to the Lord. He said, Johnny, you ain't doing nothing with that house. You might as well let Yavit have it. So I'd be glad for you to have it and be glad for you to have it, be my neighbor, right? So I was able to buy the house um, from the investor. And, um, you know, this really does... Uh, is a tribute to LV and hopefully something that we can share for all of the world uh, going forward. And sort of bring back this spirit, hold her spirit. It won't be exactly like it was in the past, uh, but it can serve as the spiritual cornerstone for this LV Hall Legacy Center. And hopefully we can, uh, we're working on preserving it so people can experience it again. But this started, buying the house started a new story. And we wanted to establish its importance um, and attract funding and assistance to save the home. So we worked, uh, Annalise and I, and with some assistance from a preservationist, Laura Blocker, worked on um, getting the home listed on the National Trust's uh, 11 Most Home uh, Endangered Historic Places in America. And in 2023, uh, they selected it as one of America's 11 most endangered historic places. And this is us at the announcement event uh, in May of last year. The banner says you can't spell 11 most without LV, because there's, <laughs> there's an L and a V in there. But so, uh, so we've raised some money to help preserve the house. We need more money for that. 
And we're also working on getting it listed on the National Register. And uh, so you have to correct me on this if I'm wrong, uh, Annalise, but we think, so we, we're trying to get it listed at the level of national significance, so not state or local, national significance, because it's really international. People came from around the world uh, to see her and visit her. And, um, but if we get it listed, this will be, I think, the first home of a uh, black female artist uh, in the South listed at the level of national significance. So a big milestone for creativity in the South. And, uh, and again, uh, so, and this is, just to quickly, before I move on, uh, this is a great portrait of the cooperation and the dedicated alliance that's involved. And if you, if you encountered LV, somehow you ended up working for LV anyway. So you can see, that's Mr. Hunt, uh, who sold me the house in the blue overalls next to me. Uh, we have Katie uh, McKee there in the back. I don't know if you can uh, see her. I need a pointer. Uh, we have Alan Massey next to him is uh, Hollis Cheek, who's the president of AFK. We have some of LV's neighbors and relatives, uh, Dr. Hartness and Mrs. Hartness, who were part of the Friends of LV, who were big supporters of LV and did a lot to inventory the collection, and the mayor of Kosciuszko, current mayor, Tim Kyle, who's holding the uh, edge of the banner, and the previous mayor, Jimmy Cockcroft, was also super uh, supportive. He's not in this picture. Anybody else to point? Oh, Ryan, Ryan Dennis, mm -hmm. who's on our curatorial committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, so, um, you know, a fantastic group of folks. It's really been a team effort, and you know, we promised to share a little bit about the role of storytelling and the need for uh, new narratives today, and so we hope this uh, presentation about the creative legacy of L.V. Hall has really shown you the ways that a dedicated uh, group of people can uh, tell a truer, fuller story of art and life uh, in the South and in America. And just a reminder about the events that are coming up. And um, it's December 2024. And you know, like we said, it's a team effort. So this is really kind of like a sports film. So think of it as the Egg Bowl of Art <laughs> in December 2024. And, um, and then if you would like um, more information, we'd really love for you all to follow us. There's a QR code here. You can go to lvhall.org. Um, you can send us an email, but sign up for our email uh, newsletter. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram and the QR codes for the newsletter. And as LV would say, y'all be sweet. Thank you. <laughs>